Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and we are live with the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Welcome to episode number 74. Uh, hopefully you're watching this live on our Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash understand photography. We're live every Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern time, but then we put the video on YouTube. Or, and we also turn it into a podcast on iTunes. So just do a search on YouTube or iTunes for the Understand Photography Show and you will find us. And we are really, really looking for new subscribers on both our podcast and our YouTube channel, but especially the YouTube channel. So if you would subscribe, you get a little push notification. And if you don't know what that is, that's that little tiny, like a pop-up, but it's really, really small on the bottom of your screen that will come up and say, hey, there's a new episode of the Understand Photography show. So it's not obtrusive at all. You'll love it, I swear. And then you won't miss any shows. So you'll be happy and your photography will improve and we'll all be happy. How about that? <laughs> Anyway, a couple commercials. If you're a local person in Southwest Florida, Joe Fitzpatrick is leading a few day trips. You know, we bought a minivan so we could put five people plus Joe and do the um, do the day trips. So uh, from he, we leave from Naples from our from our uh, studio here in Naples, Florida, February 21st. Joe is going to take everybody over to Wakota Hatchie and Butterfly World which is about a two hour drive from here and it's going to be a, a lot about wildlife photography so if you like that you'll like that day trip I think we have two or three openings for that and then our ever popular burrowing owls and Matt Lachey tour he's going to do that twice once in March 20th and once May 23rd hopefully May May you should see some of the little baby chicks too maybe March we're not sure yet so Joe takes you to the best sp spots and he teaches you it's a workshop if you've ever been on anything with Joe you he has more repeat customers than I do and is that fair I don't think so but people like him and for that reason his uh, week-long workshop to old Florida Apalachicola area in April is sold out so next time he, we're gonna put the schedule for next year sign up early I have openings for my ladies photo retreat though here in Naples Florida May 4th through the 6th 2018 so it's just a short little weekend and it is intense photography we do night photography sunset we learn flash photography off-camera flash photography streaking lights it's really really fun and you'll really be stretched creatively and technically but remember our motto at understand photography is we simplify the technical <coughs> see i'm doing too many commercials i'm starting to cough i got a quick sip of water because joe fitzpatrick is also the president of the florida camera club council which is the statewide umbrella group for the camera clubs in florida well we call it the f triple c and there is a convention <coughs> excuse me March 9th through 11th, 2018. I've got to have another sip. <coughs> I'm sorry. What do you do when you have a choking fit <coughs> on live? Uh, <coughs> um, you know what? I'm going to go back to this and introduce my guest, Spencer. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about you while I compose myself. How's that? Sounds good. <coughs> yeah, my name is Spencer Pullen. Uh, I've been in photography for about... Well, since I was seven years old, and I started with a Kodak 110 camera, which I don't know if anybody remembers those or not, but they came with like a little cartridge and you pop the whole thing in, and I think you got 12 or 24 exposures. And I do so, remember those. Yeah, of course, first thing I did is I went out and took pictures of the family, cut all their heads and their feet off, which mm -hmm. is, you know, typical. But <laughs> Well, you were seven years old. Seven years old. Just so, a few years ago. Yeah, so then... Um, <laughs> shot with that for a while then eventually in high school I jumped into 35 millimeter for high school projects and then in college because my background is I'm a graphic designer and a pre-press manager and oh. been in commercial printing for 25 years oh. so along the way I've done <coughs> photography because people would come in and they would need to uh, you know uh, photos for their brochures business card flyers that kind of stuff right so that's when I really started taking transferring into digital okay and then a few years ago, and I discovered film again. And how did you discover film again? <laughs> what happened? I mean, how well, this is, and uh, in, in for those of, our, of our, the people who are just listening, Spencer brought his large format camera, and it is large. <laughs> <laughs> you said this thing weighs 30 pounds? 
The actual camera body weighs 15 pounds and the lens weighs about another five, so we're right around 20 pounds. So it is a commitment to take this out. And how did you, how did you get interested in this? This is fascinating to yeah. me because it's scary looking to me. <laughs> Because a lot of people, they, they wonder, you know, with the day of age that we're in now, we have cameras that'll do 36, 48, 50 megapixels. Some will do 75 megapixels. So why in the world would somebody want to go backwards to kind of go forwards? Uh -huh. uh, my goal was to always print big. Again, okay. being in the printing industry, I just love seeing big sheets of projects coming off the back end of a press, and I just really like that. And the other thing is I always liked making big prints because it's like somebody could stand right in front of the print and enjoy like they're in the environment. Not everybody not, yeah, might not be able right. to go to the middle of the Everglades or something like that. So if they can stand there and get really close and then look around and go, wow, let's just look at the fronds on this palm tree or something like that, or uh -huh. hopefully not the alligator that's hiding in the water. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so that, that would led me a few years ago to d think about how can I make these massive prints? And I downloaded all of the high-res RAW files from Nikon, Canon, Sony, uh, even Hasselblad, though that was a little bit out of my price range <laughs> digitally. Yeah. And for what I wanted to do, my printer, I have an Epson 44-inch wide printer. Okay. And the native resolution on that is 360 DPI. Okay. So by the time I took a digital file, and you, when you go into the image size box in Photoshop or Elements or one of those programs, and you kind of do that resolution for size, mm -hmm. then basically what was happening is the size was coming down because I didn't want to add any pixels. So it wasn't going to work for the sizes I wanted to print, which is 40 by 50 and bigger. Oh, okay. So that's what led me down. I says, well, I remember back in film, um, when I did 35 millimeter film and I worked for the newspaper, uh, we would scan it. We could get a decent 4x6, 5x7 for the newspaper. But 35 millimeter was not I wasn't really impressed with the quality because I'd scanned thousands of frames over the years. So then I looked at 120 film, which is a little bit bigger, uh -huh. and I thought, well, what's, what's up from 120? It's kind of like buying a car, you know, the salesman. He's always like, well, what's the next trim level up when you, can I get this? <laughs> so then I looked at 4x5, and I thought, oh, 4x5. And then I thought to myself, well, why don't I go to B&H and see what film I can readily get every day of the week? Oh. And they offer basically up to 8 by 10 every day of the week. You can okay. get so a lot of people don't realize that film is still available. In fact, there's more black and white film choices today than there was years ago. No kidding. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. So when I found out I could get 8 by 10 film and black and white, it's affordable. Um, and then I think, well, 4 by 5 is 4 by 5, but I can get four of those up in an 8 by 10 piece of film. So I've effectively... Quadrupled. Quadrupled my, my imaging size, wow. um, and the price is not too bad. Why not do that? So that's what led me to start sourcing out cameras, and then I did a little test. Um, basically, I scanned my negatives at 2400 DPI, and that gets me 40 by 50 right out of the, or I should wow. say 40 by 60 right out of the box. No, I don't know the process. So, and it's fascinating to me that you have this printing background, because it seems to me that the people with the printing backgrounds are really understand a lot more than than I do anyway. <laughs> yeah, that sure. image size box with the resolution can get a little scary and you know you start talking about pixels and inches and resolution. It's like what do you stick in there? Um, but yeah that's and that's one of the things that's great about for photo instructors is to for people who do want to print their own photos um, to try to get them to understand, you know, like for example, Epson's 360 native resolution, Canon's 300 native resolution. Um, 300 is kind of like a baseline a lot of people use. Because okay. I was in the printing industry, uh, a lot of people come in and they'd say, well, the photo's on my website, can't you just take it from there? No. And of course, that's 72 DPI, you try yeah. to print it and it's all blurry, but yeah. So luckily I had that background to know that if I want to get something really massive print, um, how, can I, how can I get the equipment to do what I want to do? So you take, you take the negative from this big camera mm -hmm. and you put it into a scanner yes. of some sort. And do you have a specialized scanner for that? Yeah, is it's, that in a, it's an Epson V800, <coughs> which that, is built for eight by, up to 8x10 film. Oh, it's actually a, a film scanner built for that. But it'll also, well, it'll also do prints and it'll do 35 millimeter up to 8x10 film. But you can also do regular prints on it. So basically the transparency uh, bulb in the lid 
okay. is much wider than your average scanner. So that's why when you close the lid, you can scan up to an 8x10 ah. sheet of film. So what I'm actually doing is a hybrid process. <coughs> and what does and, that mean? And what is that? So, so I still have to load the film uh, traditionally in a dark space. Then I go out and I shoot it. And then I develop the film. I do this all without a dark room, by the way, which I can explain in a second. Okay. <laughs> and then, so once the film is developed, that's when I put it on the scanner. This is when you kind of take a left turn from the traditional analog process where you'd stick it in an enlarger. Okay. And then put it on photo paper, and then you would develop the photo paper. Right. So with that's this, the way I learned. Right. So, and now with today's technology, for people like me who don't have the room for a dark room, a specialized space, and the sink, and all the stuff that goes into that, and try to find eight by ten and larger would be kind of tough. Um, the scanners now are jump into the digital world, okay. which then I can scan the film. So you take it out of the camera, mm -hmm. and how do you keep it dark? So yeah, without a dark room, that that was one. <laughs> so I started thinking about that as one of the challenges is um, in our house because we live out in the middle of nowhere in Florida. We have salt water coming in the house, and we have no dark room. So how did I fix those two problems in the end? Basically, for the water issue, I just use um, distilled water for all my chemistry. Okay. And then to change the film and to load the film, I have what's called a dark tent. So you can imagine like a tent you might sleep in, it's just a smaller version of it, and you stick your hands in, and you can open up the film box, put you know load your film holders, and once they're loaded, they're light tight, you can pull them out, and I can put them in the camera, and then when I go to reverse it, I just put my developing drum, which I put the film down into, and that's light tight once you get the caps on it. So I put the developing drum and the film cassette all in this tent. So I take the film out of the film cassette and then I stick it in the in the drum, put the caps on, and then I can unzip it. It's light. It's light safe. Okay, hold on. I'm trying to visualize this. So how do you see? You don't. It's all by feel. You just stick your hands like in the like. Are they like plastic things or something? Like they have the surgery one. Yeah, <laughs> kind of basically <laughs> like that. Yeah. It, it, and it then is. you just do it by feel. You can't even see what you're doing. Can't see what you're doing because the minute you know, if I were to unzip and see, because the, the film would be, it would be exposed. It would it'd be wow. done. Wow. So the only thing you've got to go on, as far as to know if you're doing it correctly, is each sheet of film has a what they call a notch code, and it's in the upper right of that sheet. So when I pull the, the film out of the film box, I have to feel for this little divot that's in okay. the side of the film. And that tells you what side the emulsion's on. Oh. So I have to make sure that I load the film properly into the uh, film cassette so that when I do take the exposure, it's actually going on the emulsion. And then also when I take the film out of the cassette to put it into the developing drum, the emulsion has to be on the inside of this drum. So the only thing you've got to go by is to feel for this little notch. But so what I had to do is I practiced with just a plain sheet of, I cut down a piece of white copy paper uh -huh. uh, that was 8 by 10 and I practiced in the light. Oh, and so then learn I the closed field. my eyes and then I practiced and then I put everything in the tent and I practiced until finally I got to the point where the first time I had to load one, one film holder, which is, there's two sides, so it's two sheets of film. It took me an hour because I but had no idea about the film. But you didn't mess it up? Uh, apparently not. So I got what? something on the image, so that was good. So it was good practice. I would have messed practice. up the first 25. <laughs> but yeah, so that's. Um, now, how did you learn this? A lot of it was YouTube and the gracious people of that have come before me with this. That would, and I I go to somebody's uh, website or their YouTube channel, and I'd say, I'm thinking about getting into this. How do you do this? And there was a lot of really nice people that took now, the time and to now say. You, and now you've turned around and yeah. started your own YouTube channel. Yeah. yeah and it's all about large format photography. Pretty much correct. So yeah. if I wanted to get into this, which I can assure you I don't, <laughs> <laughs> but I could go to your YouTube channel and you would just teach me about the tent and you would teach me about how to choose a camera and you would teach me that I kind of stuff. I did a whole series uh, where we went and shot an abandoned gas station in Arcadia. We started with oh, that. So cool. I showed how, how to set the camera up and everything. Then from there, we did another video on um, the developing process, so how to get it in developing. And then there's also another video actually before that one is how to load and unload the film, because that's kind of important, because you yeah. can't take a picture until you load the film. So we did that. Uh, we did the developing, and then we also did the scanning, and then I did a printing video. So there's like five in the series. Okay. From taking the picture to here's the final product that's, on paper. So, that's so cool. Yeah, hopefully that's that so will help some people. Yeah. That, you know, 
spread the knowledge. <laughs> wow. So if I wanted to buy a big camera like this, where the heck do you get something like this? Yeah, that was another challenge uh, <laughs> when I started looking a few years ago is there's only pretty much used stuff or the new stuff was so out of sight that I mean, something new you like this. You're talking. Wise. Oh yeah, price wise, you're looking five to ten thousand. Oh yeah. And the lens would be another five thousand. And most people, they're like, you know, yeah. I mean, if you have it, great. But if you don't, yeah, <laughs> uh, maybe you don't want to invest something like that in this. So this is actually used off of eBay, and That's it came as you saw it. It came with this lens. The lens is a Nikon, what they call a Nikon W three hundred millimeter five point six lens. And the shutter is built into, that's this outer part here that's built on under the lens. And this came as you see it. But if somebody wanted to get into this today, uh -huh. the good news is there's a few companies, there's one in England and there's one in Italy that are now starting to make these types of cameras that are actually affordable. Really? Like so affordable meaning You what? can get into a 4x5 camera for about $250. You're kidding me. Yeah, it's pretty cheap. Including a lens. No, that would no. be a little extra, but th that would be an aftermarket item. So maybe on eBay, you probably pick up a lens for, if I had to guess, about 100 maybe $150. That's not, so it's actually, not, that's it's not, it's too, not bad too bad at bad, all. Yeah. So you get some film holders, you can get those used if you want, and they're, for 4x5, they're pretty expensive. So I'd say you could probably get yourself tooled up for everything for less than $500, probably even including the chemistry. Wow. The chemistry is not that expensive. That's uh, one of the questions I guess. People say, well, this looks like fun, but it's got to be expensive. So how much does it cost? How much does it cost? I'm shooting uh, Ilford's FP4+, Plus, which is a classic type of green film. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, when I get it from B&H in New York, it costs me about, we'll say, $4 a sheet. Okay. And so I get one click, one sheet, one picture. And then the developing costs me about a dollar because I do it myself. I don't send it out. Okay. So it costs me 5 bucks a click. And Which if you're is a lot out, more than we're used to when we have a digital camera, but... Right, exactly. So, but you're more careful. <laughs> well, that's the thing, is when I used to shoot digital, I'd go out to, like, Micah State Park or some of these great birding places, and you go out and you shoot 2,000 frames, 3,000 frames, you come home, you download on the computer, and then you've got to pitch all the ones that are no good. With this, uh, I spend the majority of my time scouting location. So then when I see something I really want, i got to ask myself, is it worth investing my time uh -huh. because to set this up takes probably 20 minutes to 30 minutes to get set up and then when you get ready to take the photo um, so but I know when I come home I've got one really great that you're photo really that is really with. yeah so um, you have a big tripod that you, uh, you showed me too that goes right. that so the whole thing is 50 pounds you said to carry around right yeah pretty much so you mostly do your scouting do you just use your cell phone for scouting or sometimes I'll do that or I bought a little wagon from one of those warehouse clubs uh -huh. and for example I went up to um, Old Car City with a with a photo club for a couple days and uh, I forgot Georgia was all on a hill yeah. <laughs> versus <laughs> Florida so I put everything in the wagon and I just pulled behind me so in two days I took four pictures Really? And I was four there from, from 9 in the morning till, you might as well say, 4 in the afternoon. I probably would have taken 4,000. <laughs> yeah, so it's, um, it's definitely a different way of thinking, but it's just amazing when you can zoom in and you can see every little piece of dirt or scratch, like on some of these cars. It's just totally amazing. Wow. Now, what do you mostly take pictures of? Right now I do a mix of Florida landscape because I'm kind of... That's my and home you live base. Where do you live in Sarasota? Or? Uh, Port Charlotte. Port Charlotte. Okay. Yeah, How long work. have you been there? Since 1988. So you got hit Beth. by that hurricane. What hurricane did you get hit by? Hurricane Charlie is Charlie. the one that I that know we was, had. Um, that's it hit you. Yeah, it came right up the uh, the, the river, and that's what fed, that's what fueled it until it kept going up through Orlando and kept on going. But yeah, that was that was bad. Our neighbor's wind meter broke at 225 miles an hour. So Irma was bad, I mean, because of the size and, Irma and the hit path. Us. Yeah, so. But, but not Charlie as bad for as us was a hit. whole lot worse. You yeah. got really bad. That was, people were homeless for years. I remember seeing yeah. those trailer, whatever, the off the I-75, yeah. whatever, for yeah. years. Yeah, we were without power and without water, I think, for a month. Wow. In August, in 95 degree heat. <laughs> yeah, I know. The hurricanes so, always hit when it's hot. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But, oh well, hopefully it's all better now. 
Okay, so you do a lot of Florida landscapes. Well, Mayaka State Park is amazing. It's so beautiful there. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to see, and the price of admission is right. You know, it's four bucks to get in. And so the other thing I do shoot is old Americana. Oh, I love that so kind of stuff. So anything that's falling apart, breaking down, like that's why I liked Old Car City. It was just these old cars from the 40s and 50s, and it's just amazing just to see them rotting away. To me, it was art. Some yeah. people are like, oh, it's depressing, but it's just amazing to see that um, just the, the old style of way that they did things. Yeah, well, so. and, and if the audience, if you don't know the story of Old Car City, it's pretty interesting because the guy owned a junkyard. Correct. And then he learned that he could make more money getting photographers to come for $25 Absolutely. a day. Yep. So now it's just photographers there all day right. long, yep. and the guy's just sitting on his butt collecting <laughs> the money, right? Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a really great place. And that's about place. an hour north of Atlanta, correct? Correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely worth the trip. Um, if somebody's going to go and make that a destination, I'd spend at least two or three days up there really? just because you could spend one day just shooting all the hood ornaments oh. of all the old cars oh. and the taillights and things like that. But Do you have any favorite spots for old Americana in Florida? It's getting tough because it's like something is five minutes old down here. They just they tear plow it, down, it under and they just, uh, <laughs> you know, build on top of it. But I'm going to go look for that gas station in Arcadia. <laughs> yeah, that that's, that's cool? right next to Morgan Park, if anybody's familiar with that area. Um, and I ran into the, while I was there scouting it out, the uh, one of the police officers stopped by and it was a good, it was a good visit. <laughs> and he <laughs> says, oh, you like our gas station? I said, this is awesome. It was also an abandoned house there. He says, what they use it for now is SWAT training. So mm. at night they'll put people in there, and, but they don't mind if you go and take photos. It's, it's open and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's okay to go in there. So I love but, stuff uh, like that. But yeah, there's also, we've got, um, I'm trying to think of the village up in Largo, not History Village. It'll come to me. You probably know where it is. You've probably been there. I don't know. Okay. It's not well, coming to me anyway. Uh, yeah. There's Manatee uh, Village up in Manatee County, which is nice. It has a lot of old structures that okay. you can go. Heritage Village, that's the one I'm trying to think of. I don't know. Heritage Village is one up in Largo. So what they did is they took all these historic structures that were all over Florida and they put them together in a oh, village. in one area. Yeah, so you can still, last time I was there, you could still buy a Coke in a bottle for 25 cents. Oh, wow. Um, they have a couple of old Model T Fords parked in the old garage. It's still themed like it was back then. Oh, I love um, that kind of stuff. Train station, uh, school, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a really great destination if you're into history and Americana. Now, have you been to the Apalachicola area? No, that's on my list because I heard about all the, all the boats and things up I there. I went there just on the way home from a long road trip and I was like oh my goodness I love it's like old Florida so I came home and I'm like Joe we're doing a <laughs> trip here so then we went up last April and planned the trip and then now Joe is taken but he's it's sold out because it's it's fa it's fabulous up there and it's not that there's a lot of history still but there's more there than there is in a lot of places but the you know the landscapes are amazing too up yeah. there so I'd it's like a lot to of been left alone a little bit better than because down here I think you know it's it's cold up there it's practically Georgia you know that's true. so it's uh, they have winter they have snow you know <laughs> the snow in Florida snow. <laughs> <laughs> not too often yeah. but this year they did yeah. so anyway all right so landscapes Florida landscapes Florida landscapes simply because that's that's where you live kind of where I'm living and yeah my home base I don't get a chance to travel a lot because I am teaching classes at uh, two universities. And you and teach photography. Photography. That's your main profession as a, in, a photography instructor, yeah. right? That's so, how I knew you or knew of you. I knew of oh. you. Oh, the guy who teaches up in Punta Gorda and uh, Inglewood area. Yeah. Okay. And Sarasota. And yeah, so I'm up in that neck of the woods. So you're teaching as your full time, but you are also an artist, fine art. Photographer. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do is uh, get some of these prints to galleries around the country and start to get that ball rolling because everybody I've talked to that's looked at my work, whether it be in an art show or just the general public, I'll say, what do you think of this? And they said, well, you really need to be in, an, in a gallery. Okay. So because of the, and the other nice thing is because of the handmade of the tactile of, you know, I'm not just, I'm not 
downing digital photography at all because we all know it's not the camera that makes a beautiful image, it's the person behind it. Right. So with this, it's a little bit more handmade process that I've got to load the film correctly, I've got to expose correctly, I've got to develop the film correctly, um, and then hopefully I scan it and do whatever correctly to finally get an image. So there's a lot more work that goes into one photo. So I think that might appeal to And film to has a unique look to it, right? It does. Um, and I don't, I can't pinpoint it to describe it, but. Some people like grain. You know, it's it, it's a different pattern, and now it's like noise in the digital world, right? Nobody wants noise. Uh -huh. uh, but with film, you can choose if you want. For example, this FP4 has an ISO rating of 125, which is very, very fine grain. So I can blow something up, and again, you can see every little crack and detail and peeling paint, whatever it is. Uh, friends of mine, they like HP5, which is another Ilford film that's rated 400. And then what what they typically will do is push it to 1600. ISO okay. and then that gives them more grain because that's a different look you're talking about looks and you push and it to the ISO in processing yeah in processing okay. so you would shoot See, it I'm, this is all new to me so I'm like trying to follow okay and, okay yeah so basically you would um, when you go to take the pictures you pretend that you put 1600 speed film in the camera and then when you go to develop it you would tell whoever's going to develop it if you're going to do it yourself you just alter the times to make it 1600 fit speed film and then that's so if you um, if you go up the scale in ISO your grain gets bigger okay if you go down in ISO you get less grain so, so. they like that look that's why For, they're doing yeah. that okay. so a lot of people and you can play with all different kinds of developers and film and you know now we've got uh, I use Nick Silver Effects Pro a lot when I was doing digital mm -hmm. so in there there's a lot of grain choices you can choose but you can mix and match in the analog world developers with film and you can get all kinds of different looks and things like that so it's just fun just to play and see what yeah, happens. Yeah it sounds really interesting. So, some days it works and some days it doesn't. Um, a couple of weeks ago I took this out into a hay field and tried to take a picture in 20 mile an hour wind. Do we have hay fields in Florida? <laughs> it was up by <laughs> Mayaka. Yeah, it was kind of way up in the middle of the state, but um, uh, it didn't quite work out because the minute I opened up the bellows, 20 mile an hour wind, the, the bellows is like a sail and just the camera uh, dish vibrated. So with a one second exposure, uh, so there's there are limitations to what you can shoot with this. Because you know, I, I was thinking it's so heavy that it wouldn't be a problem in the wind, but I didn't think about the bellows. Yeah, everything was. I mean, it would, yeah, yeah, the wind was, would get in between all those bellows and yeah, yeah. And just start shaking. But and nothing can be moving really in your image unless you want to go for creative blur. Like I, of course I've done waterfalls, and that's always nice. You get the nice silky waterfall which everybody likes. But um, I couldn't shoot birds with this. Oh, Could gosh. you imagine trying to hold this and go, okay, get ready. <laughs> uh, I hope I got it. That's it. Hold on, i got to reload. You know, and you get another, uh, here comes another bird. Yeah, that's not going to work. But uh, <laughs> Do you shoot digitally as well? Um, not really anymore. No. no. But you must teach digital photography. I do. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And it, of course, when I go out with a class, I'll take my, I've got a digital Nikon D300. It's 10 years old. It's 10, mega, 10 or 12 megapixel. And uh, when I shot commercially for magazines, that's what I used. Uh -huh. But now when I'm teaching, that's what I use as a teaching tool. But right. if I'm going to go out, I take this you with take me. You take the big guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does he have a name? Well, uh, initially <laughs> we called it Big Bertha, but then I found out another well-known photographer called their enlarger Big Bertha. So we had to, now I just call it the Beast. The Beast. <laughs> the beast. I like that. The Beast. <laughs> so, but, it's oh a lot of fun. Oh my goodness gracious. And how long have you been doing this with the large format? I switched to large format oh, about a year and a half ago. Oh, so really not that not, long. Not too long, yep. I've shot about 75 sheets of film, the large format. So it's, it doesn't, may not sound like a lot, but... You know, if you're doing four, two pictures a day, what you said you only shot four pictures in two days at Old Car City? At Old Car City, yeah. So you drive all, what, eight hours up there to get... <laughs> And I took, came home with four images. Oh and the best part is, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'll, I won't tell on myself. Um, it was very tiring by the time we got up there. And at night, I was putting the film, like you were talking about, in the dark. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I thought I had loaded one side of the film holder. So then I went to go shoot the last picture of the day. And wow. I, then I went into the dark to pull the film out, realizing I did never put the film oh. in the cassette to begin with. Oh. So I, oh. it's all right. It's a good excuse to go ah. back. <laughs> That's all I can do, right, to look at it. I'll go. I've never been there. <laughs> Joe went a year or two ago, and 
hit a lot of cool pictures. It is a great And then I know a lot of the, like all the big name photographers do workshops in Old Car City now. Yeah. That junkyard guy just was, it was brilliant on his part. It's so funny that it was a junkyard. <laughs> yeah, and that's when we were eating there. The locals said, where'd you guys come from? I said, well, we came from Florida. He goes, what are you doing here? You know, of all places to go. And they said, we're here to go to Old Car City. He says, you mean that junkyard place in White? <laughs> it's in White, Georgia. And we're like, yeah. I was like, oh, okay. I said, have fun with that. But it was great, yeah. yeah. That's funny. Now, you have an exhibition of your artwork coming up soon, right? Yeah, March 10th at the Englewood Art Center. I'm going to have all of my big prints um, that were, those were printed 32 by 40, simply okay. because the mat board comes 40 by 60. Oh. So without having to get special mat board from the mill, we're, we're sticking with that size. So the finished size is right around 48 by 58 or some, uh, they're, they're, they're pretty good size. How many do you have? I'm going to have uh, seven at the show. Wow. So, because they're so big. And oh, is it a, a special exhibi uh, exhibition just for you or is it the a Englewood, theme? Or? The Englewood Camera Club is also going to be having um, the, some kind of show there as well. And is this a, so is this a certain time on March 10th? Uh, 2 to 4 is the reception. 2 to 4 p.m. If you can't make it March 10th, the, the work will be hung for three weeks. Okay, so because anybody that's in the area could stop by and see it. This is a little bit of a conflict because before I went into my choking fit, <laughs> <laughs> I was about to make a commercial for the Florida Camera Club Conference. Oh, yeah, you're right. It's which is March weekend. 9th through 11th yep. in Fort Myers, Florida. However, let's make this work for everybody. Let's do a win-win. Okay, so the Florida Camera Club I'm missing a, it's F triple C, Florida Camera Club. Council. Council Conference. <laughs> wow, there you go, it's a lot of C's. It's a lot of C's, F triple C Conference mm -hmm. is in Fort Myers, Florida at Florida Gulf Coast University campus. Mm -hmm. So it's spring break, so the kids are gone. So we, so F triple C is taking over the ca campus and it's gonna be a fabulous convention. They've done it. I know they did it last year and then I think two years before that, but now it's every year because it's gone, it's been, it's just getting more and more professional. They've got two um, keynote speakers. One of them is Parrish Cohanum from Atlanta, Georgia, by the way. There you go. <laughs> and he's a creative uh, portrait artist. And then also Maxis Gamis, who I'm sure oh, you know, he's mm -hmm. a bird photographer. And then a lot of other speakers, including me. So if you decide to fl come to Florida, for the conference because March is a really good time to come to Florida, especially if you live in Michigan or New York or something. Yeah. It's just, you're sick of winter. <laughs> come to Florida, come to the conference, take a little break and drive to Englewood, which is only what? Not even an hour from Fort Myers, right? Yeah, probably not even an hour, correct. You can see, you can go to Spencer's show, see his pictures, buy one. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and then come back to the conference. Yeah, there you go. In fact, I'm not even speaking uh, Saturday afternoon, so it's okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> you won't miss any of my talks. <laughs> well, if they've got a full schedule, I say the work will be hung. Uh, I believe the center is closed on Sundays and Mondays, so Tuesday through Saturday they're open. So any time they would like that would fit their schedule, they could go and Can see just it. Just go, yeah. and, and and we'll we'll have the information and the address and the hours of the exhibition on in the show notes on understandphotography.com. Um, Hold on, I just had something flit in and out of my mind that I wanted to ask you. Oh, okay. So you've got these seven, you know, beautiful mm -hmm. pictures hanging. Do you do prints of the pictures as well? Mm-hmm. So yeah. you, and you, they could buy the original. Yes. Um, they're all numbered sets, um, so generally up to 100 right now. And I've also got a, uh, I'm working on what's called a photo zine. It's not a photo book and it's not a zine. That's the new buzzword in photography. Yeah. It's, uh, so I kind of blended the two together with my print experience. So that's going to also be available if anybody would be interested in that. Okay, tell uh, me about that. We've yeah, got the, time. Look. Oh, okay, good. Clock? Yeah, yeah. We've we'll got time. <laughs> we got time. <laughs> so yeah, the photo zine is, um, I looked around and to get a really nice photo book, it was probably going to cost anywhere from 50 to to $100 a book. Right. And initially, I want to hand these all out to my friends and family. Yeah, but not at, at fifty, 50 bucks and seventy-five dollars a yeah. click, yeah, a click, I couldn't do that. You're, you so, don't like them that much. No, no well, yeah. 
Christmas gifts, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, so what I ended up doing is, and I looked at the zines, and what I saw what a lot of people <coughs> were doing is they would um, take their images, lay them out on some program, and then go to the local printer and have them ran off, maybe on nice, decent copy paper, and then they would be stapled. And I thought, well, that's, that's one way to go. It's, it's a nice product. It's um, definitely price effective. So I did a lot of digging, and I found a uh, printer who's up in Montana that I'm going to give it a try. I haven't tried them yet, so this will be my first uh, project with them. Mm. But they actually have uh, photo books where it's going to be printed on nice gloss paper with a heavy gloss cover, and it'll be UV coated, which gives you that real nice shine on the outside, and perfect bound, which is um, so it's not stapled. It's like a regular book you might buy in a bookstore that has okay. a flat binding. They call that perfect binding? They call that perfect binding. Okay, yeah, the one with that. the staples is called saddle stitching. Okay. If you ever, yeah, this is all more well, stuff I don't know anything about book <laughs> More binding. useless information about uh. book binding. But yeah, so they, they found that I could actually get the pricing <coughs> down to a decent uh, <coughs> price point per book that. I can buy them, and if somebody did want to buy them, you know, they're not going to have to say, well, geez, why should I spend $50 on a book? And so the price point would probably, probably is going to be around $20, $25. No, this is, a, this is not really a magazine, then it's a book. It's a kind of a book. blend between the two, yeah. It's not as, <coughs> it won't have the heavy cov cover like a photo book, but it's going to be, and I did something a little bit different also with the layout. A lot of people, what they'll do is they'll just put photos in and, page after page and mm -hmm. you get photos and they might put description of where it was and things like that. Mm -hmm. So what I decided to do is a lot of people, uh, my blog is about 10 years old, they like the back stories. So what I ended up doing is putting the photo on one page and then the back story and the process on the other. Uh, for example, me trying to climb down Hillsborough River State Park down on all the tree roots with this backpack on my, with this thing. Oh, with your and big camera. And to see camera. if people were, you know, <laughs> gathering to see if I was going to make it to the bottom or if I was going <laughs> to fall in the water or if I was going to get eaten by an alligator or whatever. But, uh, so that's what I ended up doing. I wonder so if anybody was videotaping you. Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to check Facebook or, uh, or on YouTube and see if it's oh, on there. That's funny. But, yeah, so basically it's 20 images and it's 20 stories. Oh, so I it's totally, that. and then with my my intro and all about me pages. It's going to be about 48 pages total. I, um, I told you before we started talking about this art business consultant who I know named Carolyn Edlin. And she teaches, um, actually I have a shorter talk based on a little bit of my own experience, a little bit of what she teaches, called, but she teaches a sell your photography as art. Now, that's my title, but she teaches that here once in a while. <coughs> and um, she was talking about how important the story is behind mm -hmm. each art piece. And it's interesting that you, you know, you picked up on that already. Obviously, you know that because people do really, are really interested in how did you get that shot and, and, right. and what, you know, what is the story? And of course, I'm, people who listen to the show or watch the show all the time, they know my story about Clyde Butch Butcher the first time I photographed him at an event. He had this huge picture of his printer, a black and white picture of his printer with the story of how this was the greatest printer on earth. And I thought, this is weird. I just thought it was weird, right? <laughs> so years later, Joe is given a private lesson to somebody at their house, and he sees a Clyde Butcher picture hanging up, and he said, oh, is that a Clyde Butcher? And this guy says, yeah. He said, you should see Clyde's printer. And starts talking about the printer. So this, the backstory about this printer. See, Clyde, he's the master marketer. He oh, yeah. knows what he's doing, man. And uh, the story is important. And so she she teaches that in her classes too. The story behind each art piece is really really important. People people buy art for emotional reasons. Exactly. They got to feel connected to the piece. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it it might be that you know. It might be, oh, I've always, you know, it might be emotional because they like that spot and they've been right. there before, or it's pretty or whatever, you know. Some people just buy it because it'll look good in their living room, which, you know, whatever. But, but knowing this, the artist is really important. That's why these exhibitions, when, and they have the open house so they, you can meet the artist. Right. And the story is awesome. I love that idea. So this is a, you're calling it a photo zine. A photo zine <laughs> is what I call it. It's a blended product of its... It's not as heavy duty as a photo book with hard, you know, hard r image wrap around, and it's not a uh, car. It's not a digitally copied. Uh, 
Z now, Nieder. for our, our, our audience who wants to create their own books, is this a viable option for them? Do you have to have a book, you know, do you have to buy 20 of them or 100 the or 20,000 or? Yeah, the minimum for, that was the other thing is, you know, a lot of people don't want to become the bank and have to buy 10,000 of these and then sit on them until they sell them. Right. So with this company, the minimum is 10. That's not and bad. So and it's it was very affordable. affordable. You can either do it yourself. Um, I'm using a program, a Adobe program called InDesign, okay. which a lot of people are familiar with. Yeah. Um, if anybody's ever heard of Quark, that's another, used to be the big king back in the day. Okay, I don't know. Um, but anyway, those are page layout programs. So you could do it yourself, or you can use their online design tool. So this they is do the company you're talking the, about? The, the, yeah, a printing company. And okay. even like Blurb or some of these other photo books, they have an online tool that you could Blurb use. Blurb uses Lightroom, don't they? You can use Lightroom, but they also have a, a, pro, a software you can download to your computer. I believe it's called BookWrite. Okay. And you can do it right on your computer, and then that sets out all the template and everything. So then you can just upload it right to their server, and then they print it and send wow. it, drop ship it. That's so cool. And I think... Now, are you going to have these books for sale at your exhibition? Or can you sell there? I'm not sure if I'll have them. I'll probably have some copies for just display so people can look at them. Um, but I probably will not have them for sale there. What is the uh, topic? What are the pictures of? It's my first full year in large format photography. Ah. So it's kind of a, a mix of Florida landscape and some of the Americana stuff that I've done. Okay. So I'm hoping later to come out with themed issues like, you know, my Florida water collection and my uh, Route 66 collection and things like that. Have you done Route 66 yet? No, that's on my list. That's one reason why I bought this, is I want to do that. Remember I told you I went to Apalachicola on my way home? Right. That was part of my road trip. Was right. I didn't do the whole thing. I was by myself, and I, I didn't even, I really didn't even plan to do it. I just, my son moved to Los Angeles, which actually, I'm sad, <laughs> because he's too far away. But anyway, his wife... Um, got transferred, so mm. she just left. Boom! She had to go because she had to she had to work. So he stayed home and sold all their stuff. And I said, "Well, you know, we'll take the seats out of the minivan and we'll take the Understand Photography minivan to <laughs> Los Angeles." Go. So we had this wonderful road trip. And the key to a good road trip, in my opinion, is to plan. And so I spent a lot of time planning the trip from Naples to Los Angeles because, to me, time with my son is the best thing on earth, right? But it is so time consuming to plan. So I got tired of planning. Plus, I'm working, trying to get ready to take time off and all this other stuff. And so I didn't really plan my trip home. I just knew I wasn't coming straight home. I was going to Atlanta. Okay. And uh, so I didn't really plan the Route 66. But then I saw that it was right by I 40, the thing that I thought I was taking. So right. I did a lot of, you know, but it. It's a little scary for a single woman in some parts around 66, so yeah, it's <laughs> I stayed on the high, yeah. highway a little <laughs> bit more probably. If I was with somebody, maybe I would have been a little more daring, but oh, it was awesome. It was really awesome. Rick Salmon has uh, a lot of, uh, I think he has a class or something on Route 66. Maybe he's got a photo book, I'm not sure. But he's, That'd be great off to look that up. Yeah, it was so cool. Talk about old, you will go crazy because it's got all the old fashioned stuff. I have to show you the one picture of the gas station I got. I can't remember where it was. I think it was somewhere in Texas. And it was just this old gas station from like the 20s or something or 30s or 40s. I don't know. Not 50s. It was before that. It was so cool. It's got lots of character, I bet. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then, and you got to go to Cuba too. Yeah, I've talked about doing that and taking, <laughs> taking this. Uh, that would be, be interesting. Yeah, you know? <laughs> like, what the heck is that? <laughs> might, have to, uh, might have to get somebody to pay somebody to cart that around. Maybe they got a motorbike or something. That could be the first uh, mobile tripod. Okay, yeah. stop the stop the motorcycle. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so that might be kind of fun. <laughs> now, do you have advice for somebody? What if somebody does decide they want to take this up? Obviously, your YouTube channel is a great place to start. Yeah, we got lots of good information on there, but if somebody really want to get started, uh, do your homework. If you don't want to print massively huge, that's ultimately why I went to this. Uh, for people who want to make normal size prints like 16 by 20, which is a very common print size, um, or even if you want to go up to the next one, which is uh, 24 by 30, everything I do is in multiples of 8 by 10. 
I don't, oh, okay. I don't crop my negatives. You don't crop at all. I use, I just crop this a very... exactly how you want exactly. it. Exactly. Um, but <coughs> four by five is a great option because it's nowhere near the weight of this. Uh, it's nowhere near as far as the cost of entry to get into this. Okay. And you can, there's the developing and everything, everything kind of scales down. So it becomes really, really um, affordable to do some four by five. But there, there are companies out there. Like I said, there's one in England, and there's that another one that are making them new. Making them new. That and, is so um, cool. But do you uh, know any of them? Can we put the, them in the show notes? Uh, Intrepid is the one in England, okay. and I just looked uh, Gimbalini, which I can send you the Gimbalini. Yeah, <laughs> the Italian place. They, they're actually doing 3D printing, um, so it's amazing. I've, I've not seen this before, but they're making these types of camera out of 3D, I guess, plastic, and the bellows that they make out of fabric, and it's very affordable. Okay. So for somebody who wants to get into it, you don't have to worry about the weight. You don't have to worry about the cost. Um, eBay is a good idea to look, but unfortunately, you never know when, wherever this thing is coming from. Is the bellow the big thing? Is if there's a tear in the bellows or if there's a pinhole, then it's kind of a problem because okay. it will it will mess up your film. Can you fix it or is it fixable? Yeah, there's some like people that, that you can send them off and have them fixed or send have them, them replaced, and but then that's an added cost. If of you can course. get into something brand new, that would be the best thing, and to find a reliable place for the lenses, because again, the shutter is inside of the lens, so there's nothing electronic about this. So it was funny. I had this set up one day and some. I don't know, must have been a teenager, come up to me, he goes, wow, it's a great camera. I said, thanks. He goes, does it work? And I said, yeah, yeah, it works. And then they, he's looking over and says, where do I put the batteries? Uh. And I said, no, no, sorry, no, no batteries on this one. It's, um, but the thing of it is, is because the lenses are older, they're not being made anymore, um, the shutter can stick sometime uh, with some certain speed. So you want to find a, and that just takes talking to people. And there's a large, on Facebook is another great resource because there's three or four groups. Okay. For medium and large format oh, photography. There, oh, there are. And they're, they've been really good to me. Um, I can't speak for everybody else, but I mean, they've, they've treated me well. Uh -huh. Anytime I've needed help, they said, oh, you need to go to this person, you need to go to that person, or check this company out. And they'll at least get you steered in the right direction. They may say, look, I, I'm getting out of it for whatever reason. Um, I'll make you deal on my stuff, and it ah. works. So it just yeah. so what, you would go on Facebook and search for large format large photog format yeah. photography. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's one large format society, and then there's another one called large format photography, and then there's a medium and large format society page, and a few other ones. But yeah, now, are there local people into your area that also do this kind of work that you? Well, obviously, we have Clyde that's up the street in Oh, Venice. that's right. He moved up here. Um, I forgot, because he used to be down here. He moved up to you. Yeah, so he's this dark Venice. room there, and he's got the, the new gallery in St. Armand's. Um, but as far as and that's other in than Sarasota. him. that's in Sarasota. That's in Sarasota, correct. As far as this, um, not that I know of. However, because of my teach students and stuff, and they'll look at my images and go, wow, now I'm starting to get some people that are interested and I've got one student that did buy a 4x5 version of this. Okay. It's the Zone 6. Uh, this one's actually from Vermont, was built in Vermont. It's all mahogany and brass. Um, but he bought a 4x5 of this, so now he's shooting that. And I've got another friend that actually got me kind of thinking about this again. He shoots me medium format, which is 120 film, so it's a little bit... Uh, it's okay. about two and a half times the size of 35 millimeter. Okay. So yeah, there we're all. I'm trying to get some of like-minded film people yeah, together. Yeah, I think it would so be more can, fun to go out with somebody. Yeah, exactly. And especially because if you go out with a digital photographer, like me, I'm like, come on, Spencer, <laughs> how long are you gonna take to take that picture? <laughs> well, not so much even setting up. I shot some images down at um, Korshan Historical Site. Uh -huh. If you've ever been in there in that generator building, and it was 20 minutes. The lens was open, gathering light. Really? Oh yeah. So twenty it's, minute exposure. So by the time you now set you've up got break, crazy small apertures on this thing too, right? Is yeah, that it's, it starts at five six, but I never use it. I use basically use that for focusing on the back, and okay. then uh, it does go down to f sixty four, which I generally use. Wow. So it's almost a, almost a pinhole. <laughs> so when you were doing the correction inside the steam engine, the steam place? engine place, yeah, that was actually f forty five because I didn't want to. Uh, that was 20 minute exposure. If I had used f64, it would have been an hour exposure. Oh my goodness! Because the thing with film is, once you go over one second on your, you know, you have your light meter and your whatever, you got to find the shadows in your in your subject. 
once you go over one second, then this thing called reciprocity kicks in. Okay. So like in a digital camera, if you need 10 seconds, 10 seconds is 10 seconds. Uh -huh. But on a digital camera, 10 seconds could be a minute. So there's that weird... You mean on a on, on film, film camera. camera, correct. And so I'm not good with, you know, slide rule and algebra and all that stuff. So thank Me goodness neither. there's an app. We oh. always said if Ansel Adams was alive today, he'd have a, he'd have an iPhone. But <laughs> <laughs> but basically, there's an app you can put in the film, and then what the meter reads, and it will tell you what to expose a film for. Oh, so it does all I that was math wondering, for how do you, you know that? Because yeah, and there's another great app for this. Is now I've got this on my back and backpack. I'm not gonna you know if I'm looking at a scene that I'm considering shooting, uh -huh. I don't want to unpack everything, set the whole thing up and get the dark cloth over my head and go, oh, this is not so good. Uh -huh. So there's another app that's called the Artist Viewfinder that is on my phone and I can pull that out and I've got the film and the lens programmed into this app. So what it does is it shows me on the, it uses the cameras, the uh, iPhone camera okay. and it shows me on a little box on the screen what the camera, th this camera will see. So I can hold that for composition reasons first, and I go, oh, this is worth investing my time of taking this, or I'll go, nah, this isn't working how I want it to. Though there's no zoom on this, so I have to physically get the camera wherever I want. Sometimes I can do it, and sometimes I can't. Wow. So. Now, what are the names of those two apps? Uh, the one for the compositional aid is called the Artist Viewfinder. Uh, the other one's called the Reciprocity Timer app that will figure out the exposure that you need. And there's another app I use that's called, it's from the Massive Dev Chart. And what that does is that's for the developing side. So you put in what film you're going to use and what speed you want to rate it at. And what it does is it calculates, oh, your film needs to be in developer for seven minutes oh. at 70 degrees. And then, oh, by the way, and then you got to do uh, stopping for a minute. And then you got to do fixing for five or six minutes. And then you got to wash it. So it has a schedule that when you hit start, you just follow the the schedule oh. and it leads you through the whole process so when you're done you end up with a developed piece of film wow so it's a lot of the guests and these are all on the iphone or iphone or android probably the yeah, android too exactly yeah so it's wow. really helped uh, so for anybody that's never done i never developed a piece of film before in my life before i got this no i, I well i, I did in school when i went to photography school but I remember being in there going, I am never doing this. I'm sending my stuff to the lab. <laughs> <laughs> that was my attitude. And it's so funny because people are like, I love the dark room, not me. Yeah, if you're, shoot that, yeah, if you're shooting 35 or 120, that's not so bad because it can be self-contained. With this, I'd have to send the physically the whole film holder off to the lab. Yeah. And that's, you know, plastic. Yeah. And is it going to get through the mail without right. getting damaged? And so, uh, wow. but now if you want to do it yourself, it's affordable. You can easily get all the chemicals, and you've got these aids to help you shoot, figure out the exposure, and do the developing. It's it's pretty. Trust me, if I can do it, anybody can do it. it. Sounds really. So, it sounds hard though. It sounds complicated. Uh, there's a few steps to it, but if you do, you know, focus on each step of the process. It's it's not too bad. And you know, if the, you live in Southwest Florida, you're around to help. Exactly. <laughs> The big advantage of having a camera like this as well is I found myself, and I'll be the first one to be guilty of this, is I get my digital camera and I go out and just start shooting, shooting, shooting. And I wasn't really mentally putting any thought power into, do I really want, why am I shooting this subject? Yeah. Or am I just shooting it just because it's there? This forces you to slow down, think about your composition. It's all about slow, <laughs> which I really, really like. Now, do you have any real, like, what's a good compositional t tip that you have? Like, when you're trying to figure out a composition of, like, a landscape, is there something that's specific that you look for? or? Well, I think it also depends on what kind of things you're into. Like, I've done trees for a while. I don't know why. I've never shot them before. But now with this, I'm just drawn to trees and the different shapes and things. Ah. Um, if I was to go, say, on the coast, maybe over on the other coast, like over in Jupiter, where they have the big rocks out in the uh, in the ocean, then that might be a nice uh, foreground element to have, and then maybe with a nice slow shutter speed, you can get that nice silky oh, effect, yeah, yeah. so things like that. Uh, another thing this has helped is that when you look on the back of it, the image is upside down and backwards. Okay. It's not right side up because there's no prism, like in a regular DSLR, when you look through the eyepiece, it's been flipped around. Right. So people might think, well, that sounds like a problem. Yeah. But what's nice is because the Im image is upside down and backwards, when I'm under the dark cloth, 
I go, I never saw that when I was standing there. So then I can adjust my composition to fine tune it to make it look look better. So it's tightening up my, my But you're my looking composing. at it upside down. And that's another thing I tell my students. Like if you have this dynamite image, you think it's great, and like especially if you're going to put it into a competition, simply print it out or on the screen and rotate it upside down. And if something sticks out at you, then there's something in there that you might want to oh, adjust. And that's then just really rotate good it right advice. Back upside up. Yeah, so that's that's one nice thing about this is that I can, since it is all upside down and backwards, it's it really things that enter the foreground that shouldn't be there or why is that you know I'll see some piece of junk in the background that shouldn't be there so I can just pivot the camera and just get a lot tighter composition okay and as far as Photoshop I don't do anything to my images as far as I crop the little edges of the film frame off uh, where the obviously where the film ends but then I simply go and fix all the dust and scratches and I add some um, contrast okay and that's it Wow. That's all it's done. I sharpen, of course, at the end. But that's it. I don't get crazy with filters or all that stuff because I want it to look like, like, like film. So. Yeah. Wow. Now, where can we see your work? Uh, you go Besides to my, going to your exhibition on March 10th. Yeah, there you go. That's a good one. <laughs> no, I, yeah, my website is uh, spencerpullen.com, and I've got a portfolio page on there, and uh, they can also see a lot of the videos and some of my adventures with this thing. And that's all on your website? That's all on my website. So you've got a YouTube channel, mm -hmm. which, of course, when you're subscribing for Understand Photography's YouTube channel, be sure to subscribe to Spencer Pullen's would they do a search for Spencer Pullen? Yeah, yeah, Spencer on Pullen YouTube? on YouTube. Yeah, okay. come up, and then I'm also but, on Instagram. Okay, but it's all all on your website, spencerpullen.com. Yes. Yeah. We can find your YouTube channel. We can find your exactly. Instagram. Yep. We can see your work. Exactly. And on your website, is it just your large format work? No, if you go back into the blog section, it does go back about seven or eight years so you'll see oh, some digital holy stuff on there moly, as well. you've been yeah. blogging a long time <laughs> yeah that was the, that was the big thing back you know that's how you got started uh to show your work you know how do we do it so we I got a wordpress site and away we went wow so. i'm very impressed do you keep it up yeah yeah we you blog keep how that often i try to do once a week uh, wow. just to try to keep keep things going but facebook is the best way to connect with me because that's every few days i can um, get something up there and then Instagram as well but if I take a photo it takes or I'll say it takes the day to go out and shoot then I might develop it the next day and then it might take me uh, roughly three to six hours to get rid of all the dust and scratches on this film Wow! so you're gonna be married to this image for like 12 hours so you better like it <laughs> but then I put it up on Facebook and Instagram and things like that so uh, that's wow. a great way to, yeah, it's... You're a patient man. <laughs> you got to be committed or something, I don't know, but it's, it is a lot of fun. That is so cool. Thank you so much for being on the show. Make sure that you check out Spencer's work on spencerpullen.com, and we will have his website on our in our show notes as well as a lot of other stuff that we talked about today great. on the apps and all that kind yeah, of stuff. We'll get, we'll get all that in the in the show notes, so... Um, thank you for driving down. No, I know it was no a couple-hour drive, so it's a it's yeah, a commitment. That's it's right. a commitment, but it's nice here. Yeah, Naples <laughs> might have to move in. <laughs> now, do you have any future plans that we should know about? Um, not right now. Basically, what I'm trying to do is um, you're still new to still this. Still trying to yes, crank out some more work and um, get in touch with some galleries and if I want to take some of those trips like we talked about and just see what see what's in America. There's so much to see I here know. that. Um, I have no desire to leave the country. I, I have a desire to go everywhere. That's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I want to go to every country. I want to go to everywhere in the United States. And, uh, but I, honest to God, I think there's so much just in Florida. Yeah. Florida is beautiful. I mean, we are so lucky to be here. I love Florida so much. <laughs> and no snow. <laughs> and no snow. We have to put up with a hurricane once in a while. Yeah. It's worth it. There right? you go. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being on the no, show. Thanks for having me. And next week on the Understand Photography Show, my guest is going to be nature photographer jo John Slo Slolina. I'm having a hard time today, aren't I? <laughs> Slo Slolina? That's not his name. Slolina. Somebody spelled this wrong, whoever did my notes. Slolina. Slolina. Take <laughs> the first L out. Okay, thank you. I knew that wasn't his name. <laughs> 
Anyway, John is an amazing photographer. You guys are going to like it. He'll be here on the Understand Photography Show uh, next Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time if you want to watch us live. And again, please subscribe to our YouTube channel at the Understand Photography Show. And Peggy Farron, thank you so much for watching episode number 74, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for watching the Understand Photography Show. It would help us immensely if you would click like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.